you so much for joining us at RBD Gecko meeting. Um, as you know, Gecko is hosted by the Gecko uh, Foundation in, associated, in association with the Project Echo at the University of New Mexico. Uh, for those that are joining for the first time, these sessions are held uh, on a Wednesday and the IBD Gecko typically every fifth week. Uh, thus far, we've had 68 uh, registrations and I hope that uh, all those people will be able to join and 14 countries are represented uh, and really would like to see more of this. Um, today, our theme is Crohn's disease and surgery. Uh, our first talk is going to be by Professor Walter Mayer who really does not need an introduction. But for those who are joining for the first time, Professor Watermeyer is based here at UCT at Hoteski. She runs our IBD clinic. She really is the IBDologist uh, in Africa, in my view. Uh, and she's going to address us uh, on post-operative recurrence uh, in Crohn's disease. Once she gets uh, talking, uh, please feel free to put uh, your questions in the chat box. We will take questions after her presentation. And then uh, I will introduce our second speaker. Um, yeah, so without any further ado, uh, Jill, over to you, and uh, we look very much uh, to your talk. Thanks, Mash. Okay. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Thanks, Jill. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I'm going to chat a little bit about uh, what happens after the surgery, and Adam's going to chat a little bit about what happens before the surgery. So we've got it a little bit the wrong way around, but I don't think it makes too much difference. Okay, so post-operative recurrence of Crohn's disease is extremely common. It's almost ubiquitous, and it typically occurs at the site of the anastomosis or proximal to it. And when you look at post-operative recurrence, there are essentially four different categories. There's histological recurrence, which happens... Um, actually within a couple of days following surgery and typically within one week uh, and one will start to see obviously features of active inflammation. Endoscopic recurrence occurs in between 70 and 90 percent of uh, patients by one year post-op which is obviously fairly high. Clinical recurrence lags a little bit behind at approximately half of patients at five years and surgical recurrence 25 percent will have a second operation after five years. So where are we in 2021 when it comes to the management of or prevention of post-operative recurrence of Crohn's disease? Well, I think we've come quite a long way. So what is our current approach? Well, firstly, we need to identify patients who are at high risk because these are the subgroup that will benefit from aggressive therapeutic strategies. So if they are high risk, what treatment should we start them on? And thirdly, once we've made a decision on treatment, how do we actually monitor them to see if they develop post-operative recurrence. So firstly, we need to risk stratify our patients. <clears throat> One size does not fit all, and we need to identify, as I said, those patients who are at high risk because these patients require prophylaxis within two weeks following surgery. And these are the obvious ones which have come up many times in the literature. Patients who've had a previous uh, operation, particularly if they've had two or more, smoking, because that is the major predictor of post-operative recurrence of Crohn's, and the presence of penetrating, fistulizing uh, phenotype. Other ones are young age, granulomas in the resected specimen, myenteric plexitis in the resected uh, bowel, Crohn's disease at the proximal resection margins, and the type of anastomosis. Uh, side to side anastomosis appears to uh, be uh, better than end to end. Equally as importantly, we need to identify the low risk patients. We don't want to overtreat these people, and they very likely will uh, get away with no prophylaxis or a watch and wait strategy. And these are patients who are older, who have short segment disease, fibrotic stricture, have long duration of disease, and non smokers. And in between the two, those are uh, people with intermediate risk, and one can consider prophylaxis in those individuals. What therapies are effective in treating post-operative recurrence, or should I actually say preventing it? What doesn't work, first and foremost, probiotics, turmeric, vitamin D, and steroids, in particular, budesonide. The fiber minor salicylates do have some efficacy, but it's really fairly minimal. And uh, you can see the large numbers needed to treat them. And uh, really, it can be used, but only if there are no other options. And this is, uh, in particular, pentaza and acetylcelazepirine does not seem to work in preventing post-operative recurrence. So the two that seem to be our best options are the imidazole antibiotics and the thiopurines. So why might antibiotics prevent post-operative recurrence of Crohn's disease? Well, we know that the microbiome has an effect on pretty much everything in gastroenterology, but also in 
post-operative recurrence. And this is quite a nice study, which looked at uh, patients who'd had an ileo sequel resection and uh, who then developed post-operative recurrence. And they found in the resection specimen elevated um, concentrations of the proteus uh, bacteria, uh, which are pro-inflammatory and reduced anti-inflammatory bacteria, in particular, Picalobacterium prosnuski. And interestingly, smokers had much higher levels of proteus, which may suggest that it's through the microbiome that smoking is uh, doing its very deleterious um, effects. The one that's been used most is metronidazole, and it has been shown to reduce endoscopic post-operative recurrence three months post-op, and also reduces clinical recurrence at one year. The problem with metronidazole is patients can't really tolerate it for long periods of time, particularly at therapeutic doses. And secondly, the benefits disappear quite rapidly on discontinuation. So one can generally get around this by using lower doses, like 400 milligrams BD for three months after surgery, and that is our current standard practice. Um, very often we will try even a lower dose, 200 milligrams BD, as patients seem to tolerate that a lot uh, better. Other antibiotics have been tried, but with very limited success. One example is ciprofloxacin, which is not effective in preventing post-operative recurrence. So what about our immunomodulators? Azathioprine and 6 mecaptopurine are both effective in preventing both clinical and endoscopic post-operative recurrence. And this is supported by a meta-analysis and a couple of Cochrane reviews. And the numbers needed to treat to prevent endoscopic recurrence is four and to prevent clinical recurrence is seven. So these are certainly not earth shattering. The benefits are modest, but we must always bear in mind that thiopurines have lots of side effects, um, uh, neutropenia, drug-induced liver injury, pancreatitis, they require very cumbersome monitoring of their full blood count, differential count, as well as liver functions. So we use them, of course, but they're not without their problems. And unfortunately, there's very little data on methotrexate. So by far away, the best agents that we have to prevent post-operative recurrence of Crohn's disease are the anti-TNFs. And this was the first uh, rather seminal study published already uh, 11 years ago by Miguel Reguera. And um, they had a very small group of patients, but what they were able to show is that at one year in patients who were treated with infliximab, they were in endoscopic remission in 85% as opposed to 9% of placebo patients. So this is obviously a dramatic difference, but again, as I said, the numbers were very small. But after this, uh, there was a lot of interest in anti-TNFs as prophylaxis, and there were many other trials that were published, mostly observational, uh, or looking at both infliximab and adalimumab, and showing around about that rates of endoscopic post-operative recurrence of one year were about 20%, bearing in mind that it's usually between 70 and 90% with uh, placebo. Then came the seminal PREVENT study, which was published a few years back. Um, this is the largest randomized controlled trial um, of anti-TNFs in preventing post-operative recurrence of Crohn's disease, 297 patients randomized to receive either placebo and infliximab within 45 days of having their ileocolic resection. So this was the primary endpoint, which was clinical recurrence at 76 weeks. And unfortunately, this was not statistically significant in the two arms. But if you look at the secondary endpoint of endoscopic recurrence at week 76, a dramatic difference between the two with a delta of almost 30%. So why is it so good for endoscopic but are not clinical? I think the time period was too short really uh, for the clinical scenario, which tends to lag behind. No induction doses were given. Um, so normally when we use infliximab, um, we would give induction therapy and then maintenance therapy. These patients only got maintenance therapy. And one could argue that 45 days after surgery is a little bit late for um, us to initiate an anti-TNF to get maximal efficacy. This is uh, this is some data from another study, uh, uh, a post-hoc analysis, just looking at how much better an anti-TNF is than a thiopurine. Uh, so 45% of patients receiving adalimumab were in endoscopic recurrence six months post-surgery, as opposed to, um, sorry, the other way around, uh, as opposed to 25% uh, with adalimumab. A recent network meta-analysis was done um, looking at treatment versus placebo for the prevention of post-operative recurrence at 12 months post-op. And I think you can appreciate that the anti-TNFs either used alone or in combination with other agents are really the strongest drugs that we have. Uh, there's also some data for the thiopurines, whether these are used alone or in combination. And rather, no surprises, five ASAs and the antibiotics not much benefit at one year. 
What about the new biologics? Uh, Yustakinimab and Vedalizumab, both approved here in South Africa. Um, there's limited data, no randomized controlled trials, but what retrospective data there is suggests that there is some benefit, but it's really too uh, early to draw conclusions. Okay, so how then do we go about monitoring our patients so we can pick up post-operative recurrence time is you. Well, why do we want to do this first and foremost? Because early endoscopic recurrence is typically asymptomatic. And so failure to treat the subclinical inflammation may result in progressive damage. So that by the time patients develop clinical recurrence, sort of a couple of years down the line, this damage is often already irreversible. So how do we uh, identify post-operative recurrence time is and how do we actually monitor for it? Well, this is really the gold standard now is a colonoscopy six months post-surgery and using uh, the, the endoscopic features to guide therapy. And what we're really looking at is the Ritgeat score. This is um, the endoscopic appearance just proximal to the anastomosis. And we're looking at uh, remission, which has a very low likelihood of progression, is defined as a good score of I0 or I1. And that is either normal mucosa or the presence of less than five aphthous ulcers. In contrast, recurrence would be patients who have I2, I3, I4, I2 um, being more than five aphthous ulcers, I3 is when you start to get inflammation between the ulcers, and I4 is when you start getting really deep ulcers and a rather nasty looking endoscopic appearance. And the importance of the Ritkit score is it correlates pretty well with outcomes. So if you have I0 or I1, the risk of post-operative recurrence um, sorry, clinical recurrence at seven years is only 10%, which is really very low. But if you have I2, 40% of patients will have a clinical recurrence within two years. And I3 and I4, 60 to 100% will have a clinical recurrence at two years. So obviously, if they have I2, I3, I4, therapy needs to be initiated or escalated um, in order to uh, prevent further damage. So is there evidence to support early endoscopy? Well, there is indeed. This is the seminal POCA study, which was already published uh, six years ago, I can't believe it. 174 patients um, post-surgery. Uh, all of these patients received metronidazole 400 milligrams BD for three months. And they were then risk stratified as either high risk or low risk. So the high risk patients were, as I pointed out, the three strongest predictors of poor outcome, which is smoking, previous surgery, and fistulizing phenotype. And these patients received the thiopurine or they received adalibumab if they were intolerant to thiopurines. Patients were then randomized into two arms. The first arm was the standard care group where um, and they had no endoscopy at six months. The second group was the active care group where they all underwent a colonoscopy six months post-operatively. The treatment was then escalated depending on that colonoscopy, um, depending on the Ritgit score. So if the Ritgit score was I2 or above, Regardless of whether they were symptomatic or not, they had escalation of therapy. So if they had been on no treatment post-op, they then were put on to azathioprine or 60 catapurine. If they'd already been on a thiopurine, this was escalated to alabimab. And this is the primary endpoint of 18 months, which is endoscopic recurrence. And you can see a fairly um, uh, dramatic difference between the two uh, in terms of endoscopic recurrence uh, in those patients which, who had escalation of therapy based on the, that six month endoscopy thing. Of course, you can't always do colonoscopies on these patients. So what is available to non-invasively monitor post-operative occurrence? Well, small bowel ultrasound is actually very good. Um, uh, the increased uh, bowel wall thickness, altered vascularity, these have sensitivities and specificities approaching 100%. And uh, Chris is busy working on getting together an ultrasound course uh, to start to teach gastroenterologists ultrasound point of care sort of at the bedside. So hopefully we'll be able to do that in the next couple of years. CT and MRE are also very sensitive and specific. And they have the benefits in that one can also have a look for small bowel disease and perianal disease. Capsule endoscopy is very sensitive to pick up Crohn's disease. Unfortunately, there's always the risk of capsule retention, which is in about 2% of patients, but it is a disaster if it happens. So these patients would invariably require some kind of cross-sectional imaging before they have a capsule endoscopy, which is obviously going to add hugely to the expense of, of monitoring for post-operative recurrence. Fecal culprotectin is an excellent way to actually evaluate people for post-operative recurrence. And there's been a recent meta-analysis 
which shows a very strong correlation between fecal cell protection levels and endoscopic occurrence. And they found that a cutoff of 150 uh, was associated with the, the optimal accuracy. Um, so this can be used as a good surrogate uh, for patients. Um, and then those patients who have high fecal cell protection would probably benefit from a colonoscopy. Those who have a low fecal cell protection could just carry on monitoring them. Just a word of warning. There is late recurrence, so don't be too lulled into a false sense of security by that six-month scope. Even if patients have an I0 or an I1 at that six-month endoscopy, about 40% of them can still develop late disease recurrence at a median time of 14 months. Um, in this small study of 86 patients, no particular risk factors for late post-operative recurrence were identified, but really it just supports the fact that one should continue they your patients, whether it be endoscopically or just doing serial fecal pulp protectants over the long term. Just to quickly take you through the um, these flow diagrams on how postoperative recurrence uh, is uh, dealt with. So first of all, if the patient is low risk, or if, of course, if patients this is their preference, they can either get no medication or metronidazole. Mm -hmm. I would recommend a fecal cell protectant at three months post-surgery, and if this is positive or high, should I say, then an earlier scope. But if it's okay, then colonoscopy at six months. If there's no post-operative recurrence, one could repeat the scope one to three yearly. Uh, probably better would be serial fecal cell protectants during that time. If there is post-operative recurrence, patients need to be started on therapies, and really the choice is anti-TNFs and or thiopurines. Intermediate risk, generally these patients should be started on uh, a thiopurine post-op as well as the mectonidazole. High risk group, in an ideal world, I believe all of these patients should be on an anti-TNF uh, with or without thiopurine, not always possible, I understand. And again, uh, colonoscopy at six months, and if there's post-operative recurrence, you need to then escalate therapy further, optimize the anti-TNFs, add a thiopurine, um, and then continue to monitor these patients very closely with fecal uh, calprotectins and, and colonoscopies. So what about the future? Well, as I've already alluded to, one size never fits all anymore. We need to tailor our uh, post-operative strategies to the individual, not just the aforementioned risks, we need to have better predictors of uh, who exactly is going to get post-operative currents and which patients will respond best to which therapies. And obviously the future of this lies in uh, genetics and, and, and the various omics, particularly the, the microbiome. So I think uh, things are improving rapidly and hopefully we'll really be able to prevent our patients from getting that second surgery sometime down the line. So thanks very much. That's the end of my talk. Thanks, Jill, for another great talk, um, focused, succinct, and, and very clear. Um, and I see um, Mzamo did preempt what you were going to say. Um, I also was going to ask about uh, the correlation of uh, ultrasound um, with the endoscopic uh, features. So he asked about CRP and uh, fecal cal protectin. You did cover fecal cal protectin. CRP, um, would you say only if you really don't have access to a fecal cal protectin or does it tell you anything really? Yeah, Mash, I mean, it does. CRP is a good test, uh, but you remember that 25% of people do not respond, uh, uh, mount a CRP response. So it's not the best investigation at all, yeah. um, but quite good if you've got serial measurements and we certainly do it, but I think fecal cal protectin is just so much better. Yeah. And I think in a recent talk, uh, there was suggestion that, uh, that fecal cal protectin uh, threshold will be reduced further and further because of the heterogeneity that we're seeing in the patients, particularly with uh, ileal Crohn's disease. So I think in a matter of years, we'll probably be talking any positive fecal cal protectin or really quite low levels. Would you agree with that uh, sentence? Yeah. yeah, I would. Obviously, you know, the, the lower levels you're going to get, it's, it's much more accurate. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Um, Zamo, I hope that answers your question. Um, are there any other questions uh, from uh, the uh, participants? Any old thing. Don't be afraid to ask. Uh, that's why we're here. Um, perhaps while people are coming up with questions, I was just wondering that we do say that the NOT2 mutation also can predict for quite severe disease, et cetera, and post-op recurrence. Why are we not using it uh, in clinical practice or even in clinical trials to, to, to predict, you know, uh, these patients? Yeah, Mash, I mean, it, it does to a certain extent, it predicts structuring disease, but I mean, it's really not worth it because 
we really don't know what it means to be perfectly honest and it's an expensive test and you know if it comes back as positive am i going to escalate therapy based on that no yeah so just one thing, maybe Adam can answer this for me, um, or just give us your thoughts on it, is the type of anastomosis um, and post-operative recurrence. Any thoughts as to why that, that might be the case, or is it the case? I know it's a bit controversial. Uh, so there's a big, I mean, there's always the, um, there's a Cochrane review saying that you should have a stapled anastomosis because it's a theoretically wider anastomosis. And if you get recurrence at the staple line, then it'll, take longer before you get obstructive symptoms. And then recently there's been a Kono S anastomosis, which is the sort of more recent thing. And, you know, I need to see significantly more robust data and bigger uptake in the world and registry data on the Kono S before I do what is quite a complicated anastomosis in a group of patients that have a propensity to leak in the first, uh, you know, in the first place. So. Um, as I'll discuss in my talk, some, you know, IBD patients do badly with surgery compared to other patients. And I need to be really convinced that when you've got a, an anastomosis that's difficult and complex to do, that it's really going to show a, a, a major effect in the long term. Um, exactly why these different anastomoses might have an effect, I think, is quite, you know, there's lots of, sort of speculation on it, but I don't think it's very clear. And if I had to go with my, my gut, I think it's not something we'll be talking about. I don't think we'll be talking about the Kono S in five years' time. Yeah. But, you know, I sincerely hope because it looks jolly complicated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jill, I was just wondering, in, a, in limited resource settings, and you have a patient who simply can't stop smoking or won't stop smoking, should there be a policy about not offering them sort of definitive therapy with biologics or really that is discriminatory? I don't think you can do that, Matt. It's not ethical. Yeah. And we know that our Crohn's patients, they really, they all smoke and they're really heavy smokers and they really struggle to stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, perhaps uh, Adam's talk uh, will generate uh, more questions. I see you stunned everybody into silence. I guess that's how clear your talk was. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Joe. Um, well, otherwise, everyone's asleep. <laughs> Maybe we should call them. Um, I'm very pleased uh, to welcome uh, Adam Butel. He's our most famous colorectal surgeon. He's uh, the head of the uh, colorectal surgery here at Hoteskir. And really, we are quite fortunate to work very closely uh, with them uh, in co-managing our patients. Uh, it really is quite a privilege. And uh, he has agreed to give a talk on really how to prepare uh, patients with Crohn's disease for surgery. And I think they're very important and key salient things that we can do to improve uh, the outcome uh, uh, of these patients. So Adam, over to you and uh, we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thanks, Mush. Thanks very much. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks to the Gastro Foundation for this platform. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen and then nothing will happen for a while, which is always quite alarming, but um, it will come on in a second. So just, Mush, can you see that? Yes, it's coming up quite nicely. Thank you. Okay, great. So I'm going to be talking about preparing the Crohn's patient for surgery. Um, uh, sorry, Adam, to interrupt. It's coming to us as a, a presenter view. Are you able to sort of put it in presentation view? So I know uh, this unusual. Apple does this sometimes. Um, you just, let's give me a chance. Just no. So we're seeing your current slide and the, the one. Yeah. That Okay, no, no, let me just give it a second. I've just tried to get out of it and okay. it just takes a while. Okay, I'm going to just stop sharing and then I will start sharing again. That looks better. Uh, let's just see now. Okay, it takes a little while always. I think my laptop's getting a bit old, but I'm not oh, liking the sound of new <laughs> apples with the current exchange rate. Okay, can perfect. you see you. that now in the, right, in the right mode? Yeah, it's perfect, thank you. Okay, great. So I'm gonna be talking about preparing the Crohn's patient for surgery and really why are we talking about this is because 
you know, obviously surgeons have to prepare their patients for surgery, but um, gastroenterologists also need to prepare Crohn's patients for surgery. So I think it crosses both disciplines nicely. And there's a real need to prepare Crohn's patients for surgery because they do badly if you don't. Um, so a lot of the data around Crohn's and surgery is quite poor, and this talk will be no different. Um, I'm going to start off with a case presentation, then I'm going to go through a couple of um, papers that just kind of give us an indication as what we should do, and then try and sort of put it all together in a, in a solution in, in, as to how we should manage these patients. All right. So our patient is a 57-year-old woman, with a 20-year history of Crohn's disease. She's got obstructive symptoms and pneumaturia. Her weight has gone from 69 kilograms to 54 kilograms in six months. Her HB is 9.7, her CRP is 42, she's got an albumin of 23, and had no response to IV steroids. So she's had an MRE, and on the MRE, I don't know if you can see my mouse, um, there's an in, in the right iliac fossa, there's an inflamed section of bowel, and you can see a dilated loop of small bowel. And here we can see that in the center of the, um, of the pelvis, clearly highlighting section of small uh, of inflamed terminal ileum with some pre-stenotic um, dilatation. Over here, just above the bladder, we can see a sort of inflammatory phlegmon. There's lots of inflammation over there. And if you look carefully and the radiologist is very pleased with himself, they identified a fistula to the bladder. So the first thing you need to know about a fistula to the bladder is it's a diagnosis made on history. I've never come across a patient that lies about having pneumaturia. It's just not a symptom people come up with on their own. And what usually happens then is people, they complain of pneumaturia and then doctors spend an inordinate amount of time trying to demonstrate the fistula for some reason. So contrast will go in the bladder, urologists will put guide wires down, what they think might be a defect. If that doesn't work, then we'll go to contrast enemas, then that doesn't work, contrast meals, small bowel enemas, in a desperate effort to get some contrast going through this fistula. So the fistula is minute. Okay? The chance of getting contrast in it and demonstrating it is also minute, and it doesn't affect the management at all. If you have a CT scan or, or um, an MRI that shows air in the bladder, if the patient hasn't been catheterized recently, you've got the diagnosis. There's a connection between small bowel and large bowel. You can theoretically have air-producing organisms causing a UTI, but it's vanishingly rare. Knowing whether it's from the small bowel or the large bowel can usually be, it's quite clear to see there's usually some inflammation around and you can see it on the CT scan. There are two conditions essentially that cause this. It's divertic um, diverticular disease or Crohn's disease. Theoretically, TB could do it, but I have never seen it. And you can get a cancer, cancer causing a fistula, but usually if you have a cancer causing a fistula, it, it is an enormous cancer and is very easy to identify on the CT scan. So if we have a patient with new material, we do a CT scan and then we do an operation, unless the patient's got Crohn's, because then we need to prepare the patient for surgery. Okay, so in this paper in the BMJ from 2011, factors that they looked at all operations um, and indications for reoperations in England and having IBD was an independent predictor of a high risk of reoperation and poor outcome. So IBD patients do worse with surgery than almost all other patients. Obviously, emergency surgery is an independent predictor, et cetera. But if you have cancer, you get a better result from your surgery than if you have IBD. And why, why is that really? Well, if you look at what the risk factors are for septic complications are recognized to be malnutrition, hyperalbuminemia, anemia, preoperative corticosteroid treatment, abdominal abscess, and preoperative smoking. And we know that lots of Crohn's patients smoke. Crohn's can cause abdominal abscesses. IBD gets treated with steroids. IBD patients are often anemic. Hyperalbuminemia, I'm going to talk about a little bit later because it's one of my pet projects. And malnutrition is far more common in IBD and Crohn specifically than we realize. So if we look at the definition of malnutrition, aspen came up with this great 
definition, any state of nutritional imbalance. I wonder how many first class tickets to a fancy hotel and a four day conference it took to come up with that consensus statement. Anyway, a BMI of under 18.5 is also considered a thing. I think that's a bit more useful, but you know, clearly it depends on what your BMI, what your BMI has been your whole life. I don't think you can say if you've had a BMI of 18.5 for the past 20 years, you're necessarily malnourished. So what we really use is greater than 10% of unintentional weight loss. Now, remember, if you're 60 kilograms, that's six kilograms. It's not a huge amount of weight. And then if you, if you monitor grip strength, which dietitians do, and for we have patients long-term in hospital, we sometimes monitor this, then you can use loss of grip strength. But it's not a particularly useful outcome. Some patients don't weigh themselves regularly, and you've got to use surrogates of that, like a change in clothes size. Do your family think you've lost weight, et cetera, et cetera. But the moment you're noticing someone losing weight, they've usually lost quite a bit. Okay. Right. So when we're dealing with malnutrition, there are various ways of dealing of, of addressing malnutrition. And one of the things that we don't use enough of, I don't think, is exclusive enteral nutrition. So we've known that in children with IBD, they use exclusive enteral nutrition, and exclusive enteral nutrition can actually decrease inflammation by Crohn's. So feeding someone with a nasogastric tube enteral feed reduces the inflammation in Crohn's. It is a treatment for Crohn's. So something in what we're eating that isn't in the exclusive enteral nutrition is driving the Crohn's. It's quite effective, but not fantastically effective. So if we look at this patient, 123 patients retrospectively looked at, so it has all the problems associated with retrospective um, studies, i.e. selection bias, selection bias, and selection bias. 55 patients had exclusive enteral nutrition for three months and 68 normal diet for three months. It's a pretty rough get exclusive enteral nutrition for three months, but anyway. In the exclusive enteral nutrition group, the albumin came up and the CRP went down, so inflammation settled, and intra-abdominal septic complications, 3.6% versus 17.6%. And this is a theme that carries on throughout the IBD literature about preoperative nutrition, reducing septic complications. And most of the studies are not particularly brilliant like this one, but there's a signal there that people have largely kind of started adopting. So that's exclusive enteral nutrition, which you don't have to have by a nasogastric tube, but I have to say that my, you can send a, home, a patient home with SIP feeds. And my experience though is that patients when they're at home just having SIP feeds don't just have SIP feeds. Whereas if you actually put a tube in their nose, it's kind of the only way the food gets in is through the tube, they don't eat anything else. So that might just be my local hospital experience, but I certainly think that if you want to make sure you're getting good enteral nutrition, the way to do it is via a nasogastric tube. What about TPN? So in 1991, this NEJM article came out, which is a randomized controlled trial looking at patients given seven to 15 days of TPN before surgery and three days after or no TPN in the control group. Okay, and they were monitored for 90 days afterwards and the results basically showed no difference between patients being given TPN versus patients being, not being given TPN preoperatively. And that kind of killed preoperative nutrition for quite some time and certainly killed preoperative TPN. And no one's really used preop TPN for a while. But if you look at the study, in fact, when they did a subgroup analysis of the severely um, malnourished, there were fewer non-infectious complications, 5% versus 43% in the TPN. So 5% um, complications in the TPN group versus 43% in the non-TPN group. So clearly the study wasn't part for that endpoint. It's a secondary endpoint. But nevertheless, in the severely malnourished, perhaps there's a role for TPN. So... There have been numerous studies in, in Crohn's showing benefit of pre-op TPN, but they're all poor quality retrospective historical control. And they really have been reserved for patients who can't tolerate exclusive enteral nutrition. And I mean, that's the story of TPN full stop. There's no point in using TPN if you can use your gut. The question is, can you use your gut? And really how we need to use TPN or exclusive enteral nutrition is really to try to use an IBD term to treat the target. So, we don't need to get a specific weight. What we need to do is get a patient from losing weight to putting on weight. So from being catabolic to anabolic. 
we need the albumin to be coming up and the CRP to be coming down. And if you look at this, you know, how long do you do it for? And there is the sort of the key, do it, uh, the, the key kind of discussion. In this um, paper, it took a mean of 46 days to kind of turn people around. But I think that certainly our experience is one can get away with doing it with much less than that. But you do want patients to change. So, you know, really why, why are patients, why are we so obsessed about nutrition in Crohn's patients? And I really think it's the nature of the disease, especially if you're talking about patients with fibrostenotic disease and that you get patients that slowly the lumen occludes and occludes and occludes. And the patient adjusts their diet accordingly and they move from eating a normal diet to cutting fiber out of their diet and then cutting anything that's bulky out of their diet slowly moving on to a liquid diet. They may be taking odd milkshake, intermittently vomiting. And by the time they come to you, they've got an absolute pinhole and they have been like the frog in the water slowly heating up. This isn't like an adhesive obstruction where the patient's completely normal now and then they get an adhesive bile obstruction and suddenly they're obstructed. These are patients that very slowly over time become obstructed and essentially starve themselves in the process. If you're working in the state hospital system with poor access, you know, it's even worse. So we really do need to find the patients, see, ask them about their nutritional state, ask them about weight loss, and target reversing that process before we do anything. We look at the other risk factors, hyperalbuminemia, which causes are listed as infection, active inflammation, malnutrition, and can be anything that causes decreased synthesis or increased loss. And it's well established that surgical patients who have a low albumin do worse. So studies of 25 as a cutoff, they do terribly. Studies of 30 as a cutoff, they do terribly. But we also know that if you give them albumin, it doesn't particularly help. One needs to focus the underlying cause. The issue I have with albumin is that we use it as a marker of nutrition and it is not a marker of nutrition. If you ask anyone who works with anorexic patients, you will get, they will have had patients that have BMIs that have dropped down to 10 over a relatively short period of time and have an albumin of 35. So albumin is a marker of inflammation. You can use a CRP or you can use albumin or you can use both. In these patients, the reason why a Crohn's patient's albumin is down is because they have inflammation. It is not a marker of nutrition. It has no value as a marker of nutrition. But if the albumin is down, it is a marker of a poor outcome for surgery. And the way you improve that outcome for surgery is you settle down the inflammation, which you can do with hyperalimentation, but it's not actually the, new, it's not the calories you're giving or the protein that you're giving that are going to give you albumin. Up. It's the fact that while you aren't using the gut in its normal way and you're treating the abscesses, et cetera, et cetera, the, the patient's albumin will come up as the CRP drops. So, you know, people moved off measuring albumin and, and giving albumin quite some time ago, and then we started doing it with anemia. So there's tons of data out there showing that patients who are anemic do worse. And it is incontrovertibly true that if you are anemic and you have surgery, you do worse in every aspect of it. And if you have preoperative anemia in patients having inflammatory bowel disease, Val Infonsum, who's a colleague of mine, wrote this paper looking at 15,000 patients in NASCO, and anemia was a significant predictor of overall complications. I think we can agree that anemia means that you do worse. The question is, does correcting the anemia help? Um, so this is a retrospective study showing that three, of 350 patients, they corrected anemia and they corrected the hyperalbuminemia in various ways. And if you look at patients where they corrected the anemia versus no, no correction, overall complications, 21% versus 50% of them didn't correct the anemia, and septic complications, 14 versus 34%, and a similar trend with albumin. I must say, the... Um, there's a systematic review of in GI surgery of um, giving perioperative iron. And when this one was written, there was insufficient evidence to support the routine use of perioperative iron. There is no doubt that if someone has iron deficiency anemia, there is a good reason to correct it. It makes you symptomatic. 
I do not think we have the evidence at the moment to say to give you a better result in surgery. But I can't see a reason why you wouldn't correct it because actually being iron deficient, not iron deficient, not anemic, just iron deficiency on its own makes patients symptomatic. Whether you use oral iron or IV iron for that is entirely dependent on the patient and you know, working of their gut and the side effects of iron. The one thing I do think though, that if you're going to give oral iron, which is an excellent treatment for, um, for anemia in general, in general, in iron deficiency anemia, one can just, just needs to give one tablet every second day. You don't have to give, uh, I was brought up giving three, three tablets a day, every day. So you get the same effect by one tablet every second day. And that cuts down the side effects. But if you're looking for a quick fix, certainly IV iron is better. And you know, you, you get more iron into the system more quickly. There's no doubt about that. If the patient has, a, has an abscess, an intra-abdominal abscess, there is very clear advice from ECHO saying that you should have a perk drain if you have an abscess because it decreases your resection, even if you know you're going to have surgery. So you can have a perk drain and that might be your only treatment. But even a patient who's got a fistula, you know they're going to have surgery, you find an abscess fit, treat the abscess first, it decreases the, the length of the resection. It reduces the need for a stoma and it reduces post-operative complications. So there's an unequivocal guidance from ECHO saying, you have an intra-abdominal abscess, perk drain it, operate later. Generally, I would aim to operate six weeks later if I could, if I have a choice. Um, and it definitely reduces your need, I think, of all, all three of those things, length, stoma, length of resection, stoma, and complications. One of the things that we've often discussed is the um, biologics around the time of surgery and how bad they are. And you can find a number of papers that say they have no effect on perioperative complications, and you can find a number of um, papers showing that they do have an effect on perioperative complications. This paper just showed an impact with the, with the levels, so how recently the patient had had the biologic, and showed that there was, the closer you were to getting the biologic, or the higher the levels were, the, um, the, the greater the complications. Um, look, I think it's a controversial area, but what I do know is that the the people in the high volume units that I speak to have all had patients that have had complete collapses, which they've been surprised about. And it's often been associated with giving a biologic. They operate on patients regularly who've had biologics. We do it not regularly, but occasionally. And not all of them have complications at all, but everyone's kind of, you know, it makes us a little bit edgy. There's not hard data to support it, but it's certainly something, if you've got an opportunity to wait and let it wash out, I think it's something worth, um, worth giving them the benefit of the doubt. Smoking and Crohn's is well recognized. Um, so patients with Crohn's should stop smoking because it's bad for their Crohn's. They should also stop smoking because smoke, stopping smoking is good um, for all surgery, it reduces complications and reoperation rates. Um, there's no direct evidence that stopping smoking reduces perioperative complications in Crohn's, but there's you know, no reason to expect it wouldn't. It does for all other surgery or big groups, and, um, and they should probably give up anyway. So you need to encourage your patient to stop smoking. Good luck. I do think that telling people that they need to stop smoking is not good enough. Um, there is medication that can help. There are smoking cessation clinics that run. And, you know, I think giving people, you know, access to, to tools to try and help them. I mean, nicotine is unbelievably addictive and it is a very difficult habit to kick. So, um, you know, there is certain antidepressants can be used and nicotine gums, et cetera, et cetera. And I think one's got to really try and, um, utilize those because stopping smoking is highly effective. I mean, Mish alluded to it earlier about you know patients who don't smoke, smoke and getting biologics, and it's a difficult one because biologics cost in excess of fifteen thousand rand a month, and stopping smoking is as effective at treating your Crohn's as a biologic. So you know, I think ideally get the benefit of both. I would say. So if we come back to our patient, the patient's malnourished, had hyperalbuminemia, 
preoperative steroids and as anemic. So what did we do? We gave her exclusive enteral nutrition because although she had that pre somatic dilatation, she tolerated the um, exclusive enteral nutrition very well. The problem is that they often start feeling a lot better and then want to go home. The steroids were stopped. She got IV iron and very importantly, she spoke to a stoma therapist. Patients who get a stoma unexpectedly psychologically struggle with those stomas far more than patients where it's planned. I usually tell them it's stoma is not plan A, maybe it's not plan B, but if you do a lot of this, you've got to have a plan A, B, and C, and it's there. So all our patients get marked before they have an operation. That's part of the consent process, essentially. And they know that they could end up with a stoma, and hopefully most of them don't. But 26 days later, her weight had gone from 54 to 58 kilograms, her albumin from 23 to 31, the CRP had come down to 13, and HP was up to 11.1. She had a right hemicolectomy, a repair of an intravesical fistula, a primary anastomosis, and was discharged day seven post op. 30 day follow up was complication free. So I think really that's what we need to be aiming for with our patients. And while people you know, say, well, it's very difficult, especially perhaps in private practice and things like that, you can't admit a patient for 26 days. You know, getting a stoma, being admitted for 26 days. You know, it just depends how you sell it. I think if you want one good article, this patient optimization for surgery relating to Crohn's disease is a very good article. Not that new, but it's, most of these things have been around for a while. Peter Irving's got a very good reputation. Um, so I think in conclusion, there's not a lot of level one evidence, but I think there's plenty of guidance. You need to deal with the sepsis. It's probably reasonable to provide hyperalimentation to severely malnourished patients and TPN to those who can't. You must stop smoking. And I'm not entirely sure about anemia and how much we should be treating it, although that's quite an unfashionable statement. Okay. That's all I've got to say. I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Uh, thanks, Adam, for that uh, insightful talk. Um, and I think it's an important talk because I think all our patients, um, where we may or may not be planning surgery, our complicated Crohn's patient, it always is useful to engage the surgeons early on. As you say, then you can prepare patients for all potential eventualities, obviously without scaring them off, because indeed things can turn around uh, quite quickly. And I think uh, if there's early engagement, it can only improve the outcome of patients. And um, the medics in desperation of trying to control inflammatory disease, we, we just pile on the steroids and day three, day four, you sort of still piling on the steroids. That may not necessarily be the best for the patient who might actually end up uh, at operation. So I think all those aspects are uh, unbelievably important. And I think all of us should be working hard uh, to, to optimize that as much as possible. Ideally with the surgeons, but uh, you know there may be situations where one does not have you know, uh, a surgeon across the way uh, as we do. Um, I'm happy to take any questions um, from anyone. Um, if there are no specific questions, I think it would also be useful for people to unmute and maybe just give us a, a flavor of their experience uh, in managing uh, difficult patients who need surgery, um, access to their surgeons, uh, and, and you know, uh, problems with nutritional support that they have at their centers. Uh, this is also the kind of forum where we can discuss uh, what you have available and what the challenges are. So please uh, do not be shy. Feel free to unmute uh, and, uh, and speak to us. Adam, I was just wondering, I get the sense that compared to other surgeries, IBD surgery is really difficult and complicated and clearly you need training and experience and skill and numbers, you know, to improve, to improve your outcomes. I wonder if you, you would think that that's true or, for instance, uh, surgery for colorectal cancer can be more complex. That's the first question I have. The second question I have is, if you look at steroids, obesity, malnutrition, and smoking, of those four factors, which you do you think is the most challenging in terms of leaks and, and poor post-op outcomes? or are they just not comparable? They are each um, devils in their own right. Um, now you've asked me two questions and I've had a long day. So I'm gonna start with the second one first. 
Um, for me, I think the thing that I'm worried about most is malnutrition. I think that it causes, I think a huge number of leaks are caused by the patient's physiology and we don't address it adequately. So clearly obesity, all of these are risk factors, but for me, the one that gets us is, is malnutrition. I, I really do think it's, it's a huge problem. And I do a lot of, you know, with the intestinal failure unit, we've got a lot of patients um, that are given three months of preoperative uh, treatment for not necessarily for IBD, but for other conditions. And what's amazing is how low the leak rate is in those patients who are complex patients. There's no doubt in my mind that Crohn's surgery is far more difficult than cancer surgery. You know, Crohn's is a bit like diverticulitis and Crohn's are both nasty and Crohn's is worse because diverticulitis doesn't make you malnourished, Crohn's does. So I think it's mm. very difficult surgery. Look, you know, we can always talk, volume is always good, but you know, at what point, and I'm a big proponent of, you know, high volume units, but you know, the other thing about high volume units is, just, you know, at some point you start losing focus because you just do the same thing every day. So, you know, and I mean, more sophisticated healthcare systems than ours have really struggled to centralize IBD surgery. And I mean, at the moment, there's a big thing ongoing in the UK about, you know, alienal pouches, because everyone's doing so few of them. And I think part of that is biologics. And certainly in Cape Town, we've kind of decided that there are a couple of people now that we're doing so few pouches that we actually need to combine when we do them. So Ibram Dalwai, who's um, in private practice, we've agreed that when he does a pouch, I'll go and do it with him. And when I do a pouch, he'll come and do it with me. Because just to get our numbers up, because there's, I mean, with pouch surgery, there's very clear data that not only do your leak rates go down, your complications go down, but even the salvage of patients that complicate improves if you've got volume. Mm. But the volumes they're talking about are huge. Mm. And, you know, these are kind of Cleveland Clinic kind of numbers, not not her rescue kind of numbers. I mean, we're down to probably, I mean, this is pre-COVID, probably doing five pouches a year. Sure. And it's dropped off dramatically. You know, if you think of the heyday in the 90s and 2010s, I mean, pouches were a common operation. And I think, you know, part of it's been improving consent and not everyone is a candidate for a pouch, but part of it is um, patients, um, biologics, I think, had a huge influence. We're just not doing as many collectomies. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, thanks. I think you've covered uh, the questions. Uh, Chris, I see you have a question. Yeah, thank you, Adam. Thank you very much. Um, just a parallel question. Experience of, of surgery in the biologic era, do you think um, it's changed at all? I mean, anecdotally, we're sending far less, although Scandinavian data would not support reduced surgery uh, in, in, in this era. Um, and also, do you think that patients might be presenting earlier for surgery, better nourished, less anemic, better cared for? Um, I don't think so. I think the patient, so let's break it up into the two groups, really. I mean, we've got the, the patients that we're doing salvage biologics for salvage therapy with acute severe colitis. And my anecdote, which I don't think trumps the Norwegian um, national registry, but my anecdote is we're doing far less colectomies than we were. Um, and even the colectomies we're doing, it's often C. diff these days. Um, but I don't think, you know, the number of patients we have at Hruta Ski on biologics com for Crohn's compared to the number of Crohn's patients we have, I don't think we're seeing the benefit come through. I mean, the numbers have increased. It's gone from 14, I think we're almost up to 30 at the moment. But yeah. I mean, Joel can tell you, so I'm, I'm sure we should be on hundreds. And so we're still seeing patients coming in and obviously um, COVID has made it even worse. Patients coming in, you know, really by the time that they're with us, you know, it, it's not like an early little bit of a hint of obstruction. It's proper bowel obstruction and they've been going for a couple of months. Mm. So we, we still, I mean, we've got one, we operated on one this afternoon, right hemicolectomy that's been in the ward getting two and a half weeks of TPN so she could have an operation today. She had full-blown refeeding syndrome on TPN, yeah. Yeah. having to replace her phosphates and magnesium and potassium daily before, um, before we could get up to, to full feeds. So, you know, those are my anecdotes, but, you know, I, I don't think we've seen, certainly not in state practice. Um, private practice, mine's limited. We still see patients, you know, from all over the country, badly neglected from, from IBD poorly treated with biologics. Um, I think it's a bit of a free for all out there mm. with a couple of centers of excellence. 
Yeah. Um, Jill, do you have any questions or comments uh, for Adam? Yeah, actually, I wouldn't mind Adam just commenting on um, a short segment sort of ileo sequel disease and using sur surgery as your primary uh, therapy. So we were looking at the long-term data of Lyric the other day, and it's amazing. My conclusions were pro-surgery, and the person I was talking to conclusions were pro-medicine, <laughs> looking at this exact same data. So well, my conclusions are pro-surgery. Yeah, well, you know, I think it's a uh, uh, look. The, the one thing one needs to look at about Lyric is that yeah, the results of the surgery were outstanding. They were. Um, and they had six percent complication rate in the surgery arm. So yeah. I did a talk for the Gastro Foundation a while back where I looked at that paper and showed the Crudescu data and Donald Gordon data. Admittedly, that wasn't IVD surgery data. It was just all comers. But my point there was that you're the only people I know that collect the data. Um, you know, everyone else isn't even collecting the data. And so before you can start offering patients surgery, you need to know that you're getting good surgery because then the equation possibly works. And I think, you know, there's a very real place. What we can talk about, um, which I'm talking about for the BRICS um, summit, is all of this is, you know, echo guidelines, you know, what should we do? That's all first world. Thing. What should you do in South, in South Africa? What should you do in Africa? Where you've got TB that's ubiquitous and it's very difficult to tell the difference. And you've got poor access to biologics. And I think then you can really make a good argument for, for, for doing surgery first. Because you know, to put someone on TB treatment for their Crohn's for six months first, then decide it's not TB, it's Crohn's, then, then give them some kind of therapy which isn't particularly brilliant. And then four years later, come back and do a sur surgery on them and take off the sigmoid, the cecum, a bit of a wedge of the duodenum, as I've got a case that I like to present that, uh, that, that exact happened. I, I think we can make a strong argument in LMICs that we should be thinking about surgery. But just by the same token, we've got all these problems in LMICs that they don't have in the first world. The other problem we have is we're not really good at monitoring the outcomes of our surgery. And so it's, it's, you know, it's both ways. I think it's a conversation you can have with the patient. I still don't think there's a right or a wrong, but you know, in a world of TB, you know, it, it's got to push nudge you a little bit that way, I think, towards sure. surgery. Sure. And there probably aren't enough skilled surgeons um, if that were, be, were to be sort of one of the earlier options, although well, that's something yeah. that can be looked at. I don't think it's uh, that we don't have skilled surgeons. I just think it's uh, that, you know, we don't have surgeons that have lots of volume. And, yeah. and that's a problem. And I mean, there's no doubt that if you look at your results, it changes the way you behave. And I mean, we certainly notice whenever our anastomosis leak rate starts creeping up, we all get a little bit more conservative in the unit and start doing slightly less. Now, I'm not sure that's entirely a good thing, but it's, um, you know, I think, as we know, just studying something changes the outcome, so. Sure. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, I'm about to close unless uh, anyone has got any pressing question or comment to make. If not, then it just leaves me to thank Jill um, for the presentation. They're always clear um, and uh, we really uh, get a lot of value uh, from your presentations. Adam, thank you so much uh, for coming to the party and uh, for your um, presentation, which as I say, I think it is a pretty critical uh, presentation uh, to hear every now and then, and just to be reminded about how we can co-manage uh, these patients better so that what we hand over to you is something that you actually can work with. Uh, and also it's just better for patients uh, in general. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Project ECHO at the University of New Mexico, as well as our India family. Thank you so much for the technological support. Great thanks to the Gastro Foundation and to Cheryl. Cheryl, thank you so much for the work that you do behind the scenes. And Karen, it's wonderful to see you back. Uh, thank you so much for all the assistance also that you give. Just to remind everybody that all the recordings are on the Gastro Foundation website. Um, and uh, please uh, have a look at the uh, feedback form that will be posted in the chat form. We really appreciate your feedback. Looking forward to next year, we really would appreciate any comments about how to move forward, how to improve uh, our offering, 
uh, and really would like to get uh, more engagement uh, from you guys. So please feel free to contact uh, me or, or Cheryl uh, or Karen. Uh, and then finally, I'd like to thank our sponsors without whom we cannot really do the work of the Gastro Foundation. So that's Takeda, Asino, Mgen, Equity, Aspen, and Adcock. And then just to remind you finally that the next offering will be uh, PBM, Patient Blood Management. Um, and then to look forward to uh, the final uh, IBD Gecko uh, in about five weeks. Thank you so much for your participation, for your attention, and we really appreciate you. Good night. <laughs>